Hello, everyone. This is Joy Daniels, Head of Technology Partner Marketing with Magento, an Adobe company, and I want to welcome you to our webinar. For those of you who are new to Magento, we are a leading provider of cloud commerce innovation for both B2C and B2B. Our platform is supported by a vast global network of partners and developers, including our premier partner, Nosto, who is presenting today. For more information about Magento or to reach out to us, go to magento.com. Now about today's webinar. We're going to do a deep dive in AI and discuss how data is powering the e-commerce experience. Today's guest presenter, Jan Sorensen, will give us insights surrounding the inner workings of machine learning and help us discover how Nosto places an emphasis on data to tailor the shopping journey for each and every customer. Jan previously led Nosto's customer success team and as a result has intimate knowledge of AI and personalization. He is a true e-commerce insider. Now about Nosto. Nosto is a Magento premier technology partner for nearly two years now. They have a powerful personalization platform which enables merchants to deliver personalized customer shopping experiences at every touch point and across every device. Nosto has received multiple awards from Magento, including just this last year a Magento Excellence Award for Marketing and Magento's Thought Leadership Award at Imagine. We will have time for questions following Jan's presentation, so if you have questions you want to ask, please submit them in the questions portion of your toolbar. We will record today's session, and I'll email you a link to the recording in, in about a week. And with all that covered, Jan, I'll hand it over to you to get started. Yeah, awesome, Joy. Thank you for the uh, introduction. Obviously, before I start, I want to make sure to uh, thank Magento and Adobe for the, the opportunity to uh, speak today. And obviously, also working with you guys, Joy, so really appreciate it. Yeah, you've already kind of done the, uh, the introductions uh, as well. So we'll be covering kind of the, the AI deep dive, uh, how data is powering the e-commerce uh, experience. So that's the, the title of uh, today's uh, topic. Um, yeah, just a little bit of background, still uh, responsible for the North American market. So I do work with our teams in, in LA and New York City. And I guess one of the privileges of the, uh, the job is um, still to, to work with our client base as part of the CSM team. Um, so I do spend most of my day in conversation with clients, um, specifically then uh, also on, on Magento, obviously. Um, and I would say in the last year or so, the conversations really shifted towards AI uh, and how it can be leveraged to improve uh, site performance. So hopefully we can shed some uh, light on the, the topic today. Um, and of course, um, Joyce already mentioned this, we're obviously coming from the personalization angle, so that's what Nostro does. So just uh, be aware of, of that. Perfect. In terms of uh, agenda, we'll start uh, with a very short uh, yeah, brief on the state of, of AI and e-commerce uh, and personalization. We then want to do a little bit of groundwork as well, so just covering um, what AI is and those definitions. So we're working with the same uh, baseline here, uh, hopefully at the, the end of the presentation. I think then the, the more interesting part starts around the, the applications, how it's being used right now. Uh, to power different technologies, some of them visible, some of them uh, not immediately visible, uh, and then what some of those <clears throat> important data points are that can be leveraged uh, as, as well. And hopefully we'll have time then to look ahead as well. So maybe a little uh, exercise where we try to uh, look into the future. Obviously that's uh, yeah uh, a little fun exercise. Cool. Let's uh, let's get started with uh, the state of AI and personalization in uh, e-commerce. Um, yes, so I think if you read most of um, today's, uh, let's say, uh, trends, trend reports and digital marketing and, and digital e-commerce reports, uh, for example, e-consultancy e ones, uh, you, you obviously read that most of the sites and the, the priorities nowadays are really focusing on the, the customer experience. So I think um, looking at the e-consultancy e report, 78% of yeah, digital companies uh, trying to differentiate themselves through the, the customer experience, CX. Um, and that has, has really shifted, I would say, from, from the last decade, where we've gone from measuring the value of your journey uh, solely based on kind of product pricing and, and availability um, and the assortment to really putting a huge emphasis um, on the quality of that journey. So I think simply put, um, all of us, we want to make sure that business understand uh, yeah, what, what customers like, what they don't like, what suits, suits us best um, to, to kind of deliver, um, yeah, I would say world-class customer experience. 
but we also do believe that there's a bit of a disconnect as, as well. So many folks do believe they have uh, yeah, world-class uh, UI, but then if you ask their clients and customers, is that really the case? And they might actually then say that's it's not the case. So I think this is the, the study from, from Bain uh, here as well on the top right side um, where they ask companies and then their customers. Um, so there's a little bit of a delivery gap and this is what I see also oftentimes when I speak with prospects uh, in, in our industry, um, quite often if I speak with them and ask them, uh, they do believe they have a super dynamic website, they have a great uh, email program, um, but if you dig a little bit deeper, um, you see that not all, um, all of those strategies are in place that perhaps should be in place. So I do believe that AI can close this delivery gap and hopefully, um, yeah, we can give some food for thought in this, this presentation. Good. Um, yeah, so, so how do brands deliver on this expectation? I think with artificial intelligence um, shaping the future of e-commerce, I think retailers are able to learn more about their customers than they currently can. Um, and as a result, then obviously transform the quality and, and relevance of the experiences online. But I think the biggest shift that we're seeing really um, is that we're reaching the end of this current status quo on, I would say this manual test and target based conversion rate optimization. So oftentimes when we speak with, with clients, they're already using perhaps uh, split testing tools, which obviously then, yeah, force you to um, collect data, make assumptions, test, deploy, measure, and then repeat. So lots of steps um, that are not really, I would say, fast enough for this real-time world that we live in. So very slowly, we're gradually moving away from, from that world um, into a more automated uh, future. Obviously, we're not there yet 100%, but you can see this uh, starting to be um, the current current practice. And this then touches every aspect of the customer facing interaction. So um, uh, customer acquisition, conversion, retention, uh, optimization as well. And, and then I think on, on top of that as well, the fact that we then plug the, the customer experience, uh, make sure that it's um, also tying it into your specific business metrics uh, as, as well. And I think what I think is most uh, exciting about this is that we are going further than we can with um, what humans can do. So we're not just replacing uh, work that humans do, but we go beyond those capabilities as well. So hopefully we can uh, give you some insight here as well. So I think for me, that's probably the, the most exciting part. But yeah, we'll, we'll maybe take a step back and talk a little bit about the, the definitions. Um, I know there's a, a bunch of a bunch of definitions flying around um, yeah and we want to make sure we're, we're on the same same page here uh, and understand what those terms mean as, as well so let's start with um, the term of artificial intelligence I think it's obviously ever evolving but um, generally speaking AI is, uh, is used to define a self-aware and autonomous computer that exhibits intelligence on a human level so the objective of AI is to solve problems without explicitly being um, or telling uh, the computer what the problem is. It's general intelligence, uh, should be able to apply it in multiple contexts, um, and yeah, exhibit essentially general intelligence on, on a human level. And I think we're a bit far from adopting true AI, which um, is a state where machines can really replace humans altogether. But uh, even with limited AI, we're, we're going pretty far already. So I mean, we've seen all of those anecdotal uh, examples uh, about optimizing traffic flow. I'm sure you've seen this uh, Netflix documentary on, on the, um, the, the Go uh, a tournament as, as well as so, a uh, computer beating a, a Go player. Um, so, so a lot of, yeah, uh, interesting uh, use cases as well, but maybe to make it a little bit more relevant, so applying it in an e-commerce um, context. So I think here the key to driving AI is teaching your system to identify patterns in consumer behavior and then create algorithms that evolve and determine the output according to that behavior. Um, so I think this really describes uh, an important subset of AI and uh, you might have heard about it's called machine learning. So um, uh, yeah, a, a subset of, of AI, it's fairly specific to one problem usually. So it's not uh, general intelligence yet, but obviously still extremely powerful as, as well. And two terms of important in this in this context because they also get thrown around uh, quite a bit. So 
One is deep learning or neural networks as an approach to uh, trying to replicate how the brain works. Uh, and this aspect requires a vast amount of, of data, especially if you have uh, yeah, uh, fairly elaborate um, neural networks, multiple layers, um, and then to draw conclusions based on, based on that. Uh, another one is called shallow le learning. Um, this term is used uh, not as frequently in, in academia, so you, you might have heard a, a similar term called cold start. I kind of speak about the, the same thing. So, um, so shallow learning, in contrast, does not collect or analyze um, data as profoundly as the, um, as the deep learning does, but it's still a necessary factor in delivering uh, personalization, for example, for your customers. And the reason why we bring this up quite often is um, that it's specifically in e-com, uh, let's take an example of, of a fast fashion retailer. You sometimes have products that are in stock only for a few days or you have a customer engagement that might last only a few few seconds um, altogether, or you only have a few clicks, but you still want to personalize the experience um, nonetheless, right? So you, you don't want to wait till you've gathered more data, then the, the customer is gone. So very important to, to kind of look at this also, not from the big data uh, aspect, but exactly the opposite, like how little data can we get away with to have like a super relevant experience? So I think super important. Um, so yeah, go ahead and, and ask your vendors as well to, to, uh, to come up with some of those edge cases. Uh, and, and one note here as, as well, so there's a little bit of a delay between what is discussed in academia and what has real world applications uh, in, in e-commerce. And one of the big reasons, something coming straight from our data science team is, is basically that we have to deliver those experiences in real time. So. Uh, Sometimes you see really cool articles about what can be done with um, with AI, but then think about um, can we deliver this in real time in, in eight to ten milliseconds because that's that's the requirement in in e-commerce. So a uh, slight slight delay always. Great. So let's get to the uh, the more interesting part: the uh, applications of AI in e-commerce. I'm sure you've seen loads of articles around how AI is being used in fraud detection uh, and payments. Uh, it's being used for uh, voice detection, chatbots, uh, search, and so on. Um, but we want to talk a little bit more about the relevance for the customer journey in, in particular for, for your store. So I think that's, that's our angle um, anyway. So. And one big thing, and you'll start seeing this not just with personalization platforms, not just um, also, let's say, on, on the e-commerce platform side, but I would say across all tools and platforms that you use is um, using machine learning uh, for multi-layered marketing decisions and then opportunity surfacing. So, so what, what does that mean? So I think the trend is really shifting towards where predictive intelligence and, and ML can surface these fairly reasoned and, and complex decisions for people more or less just to confirm, right? Because those uh, decisions are so complex that uh, the human can't really uh, fathom what's going on. But um, yeah, you're more or less in the role of, of accepting or, or then not accepting that decision. Uh, and a practical example is obviously the, the user journey, which yeah, in this day and age is, uh, happens across different devices, happens across uh, different marketing platforms, happens on your side. Um, as well, so it becomes fairly complex and the permutations become uh, extremely high. So, um, yeah, and even today, if, if you look at, for example, Facebook, it allows you to uh, place ads across their entire uh, suite of products, whether it's, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Marketplace, and so on. So, so that's obviously AI then placing those experiences across, across those platforms. And, and this is just becoming more and more complex and taking into consideration more and more uh, more and more channels as, as well, making sure that we optimize for, for CLV and, and so on. So I think this whole cross-channel orchestration is, is a huge field for, for AI to work, it's, uh, it's magic. And along those lines, I think this opportunity surfacing, um, so you, as mentioned, the, the tools will uh, hopefully then um, help you surface those opportunities as opposed to you having to set up uh, the entire orchestration, right? So uh, I think that's that's how we see personalization um, act out and segmentation as well, where uh, the tool comes to you with with suggestions uh, and oftentimes, hopefully, uh, segments that um, yeah you hadn't previously uh, previously looked at. 
I think, yeah, let's stick with the segmentation tool actually. So instead of, you know, going for a hard-coded self-defined segment, let's say 30-year-old women who, who like yoga as an example, I think this new breed of, of tools, it will surface a segment for you uh, and suggest a specific action as, as well. So I think very, very exciting times ahead for us. Great, and, and this is a subset um, of this opportunity surfacing that I'm going to talk about here. Uh, and this shameless plug. So this is uh, what, what Nosto uh, does as, as well for our segmentation tool um, is to kind of define a customized sales funnel for each unique store. So I'm sure we, we all work with sales funnels. We all take different action based on where the customers in, in the uh, in the sales funnel and the journey. But of course, each store is unique. So let's take, for example, a magento-powered B2B site on the one on one hand, and then a fast fashion a customer on the other. So I think the sales funnels probably couldn't look more differently, right? So a, a B2B uh, prospect probably needs to be engaged over a much longer period with content and custom quotes and one-to-one -one communication, so on, custom pricing. Whereas perhaps a fast fashion um, a client uh, and a prospect might convert immediately if, if you have the right products and the right offer. So that also means that the de definition what a prospect and, and visitor is completely vastly differ uh, between sites. So um, yes, so I think currently what we see, most clients would use um, strategies like defining page views uh, to infer whether it's a, a prospect is hesitant or has any intent. But I think machine learning can definitely help you in, in a huge way um, to, to uh, improve that. So huge, uh, huge application, I think. And of course, this continues throughout the whole funnel. So it's not just prospects. If you look at what a loyal customer is, I mean, fast fashion, uh, it's definitely going to be different than uh, a B2B client that you might have uh, for 10 years or more. Um, so yeah, just going in with a fully customized uh, a funnel for each individual store, which also can shift, right? So if, if your product shifts, then perhaps your funnel will also look different as, as well. So um, very interesting uh, applications as well. Great, yeah, moving uh, moving on from this example, we talked a little bit about the opportunity surfacing and, and um, machine, learning, machine learning generated segments. I think one huge application you will see as well is kind of multi-goal optimization and um, I think this is a field where humans really have difficulties in so optimizing a store um, not just perhaps for one goal like a customer experience but then also the entire business uh, that sits behind it um, I can actually give a good <clears throat> good example from my days at a large fashion retailer uh, back in Europe so it was early days but um, we did have a pretty advanced CRO practice or conversion rate practice we had a great purchasing department, so we did have uh, amazing inventory as well. So as part of the, the CRO practice, we really optimized, obviously, for, for all the, the metrics, the conversion rate and AOV and so on. Uh, we're really proud of, of what we achieved. And then come end of the season, we got angry calls from, from the purchasing team, why certain items hadn't sold, uh, why we now have to discount those products um, and that inventory. Um, and yes, so that really tells you about these competing agendas, even within one uh, business, um, and that those actually need to work together to kind of create an optimized uh, store experience. So just as an example from, from Nostro's side here, um, and again, maybe a shameless plug, but for example, a recommender system can't just uh, improve the customer experience. It also needs to uh, tie into kind of your inventory as well, right? Because as illustrated just now, if you don't um, optimize for bo both goals at the same time, you're going to run into trouble pretty uh, pretty quickly. So I think this aspect of multi-goal optimization is going to get more and more complex and, and take into consideration more and more steps in, in the back end, uh, basically all the way to the purchasing department, uh, making sure that the whole flow is optimized, which is again a, a fantastic example of, of where machine learning can, can probably help you uh, out as, as well. Great. Yeah, another example here, custom stores uh, that are created on the fly for each individual user. I think it's probably the most yeah, illustrative example as, as well. So every store usually has completely different types of customers who engage on the site. And this example here, you can see 
uh, Zoe's experience and Zach's experience. So um, uh, perhaps Zoe is a, a yoga fan from California who shops for yoga related items. Whereas Zach um, from Oregon was into tracking and, and outdoor sports. Um, yeah, has completely different preferences altogether. So I think by applying machine learning and, and AI to understand kind of the individual needs of Zach and, and Zoe, you can create those completely different on-site experiences uh, for, for each, each one of them. Um, so yeah, I think in, in this example, you could see that the navigation bar has been changed. Um, you can see that the banner imagery um, has been changed. You can see product recommendations uh, have been changed as well in video and, and some of the, the content blocks as, as well. And I think maybe to, to take this one step further, that, that's why I'm also so excited about um, Magento and, and Adobe working together nowadays. I think taking this one step further, I think you will see a lot of the content also being created on the fly. So not just the shop experience, but the actual banners um, and, and content and so on, and even the, the copy. So I think there's lots of work to be done, um, but yeah, very excited to see um, what's gonna happen here in the future. As, uh, as well. Great, and then there's again a lot of stuff under the hood uh, that you probably might not even see. And, uh, essentially, you, you will just see how the customer experience is getting better and better, but perhaps you can really pinpoint uh, what's happening exactly. So, so one example that, that I like to uh, bring up uh, over and over again are, are replenishment recommendations. Um, so replenishment recommendations, obviously, for, for products that you can buy over and over again. Um, which is fairly easy thing to do if, if uh, the product has structured data around the replenishment cycle. So let's say if you're buying a 30-day uh, pack of contact lenses, um, they're usually obviously then uh, used within 30 days. But what about other product types? So cosmetics and, and nutrition are actually a good, good example here where maybe the, uh, the use of those items isn't completely clear-cut. So it might be uh, some people use 30 days and other people can use the same product for, for a whole year. So I think again here, that's a fantastic application where machine learning can model those replenishment cycles down to each individual user even, uh, and then making sure that your surface be <clears throat> the right experience uh, here as well. So I think again, uh, maybe a little bit frustrating that you can't really take action yourself, but I just know that there's obviously a lot of positive things happening here under the hood as well, which should um, obviously then increase or yeah, better your um, the customer experiences as well. And yeah, this kind of uh, teases up how, for example, modern recommendation engine works. And this is an example of, of how Nostro plugs into Magento uh, Enterprise, so a great kind of best of breed approach. So there's at least five layers. So I think it always makes makes me proud to, to kind of um, show what's what's happening in that black black box, which uh, product recommendations. So just to uh, give you some insight here, usually the, the way Nostra works, we look at the, the product descriptions uh, on your product detail page um, to kind of infer what the product is all about. So this is usually what we call the cold start layer. Talked about this a little bit earlier uh, as, as well on the, um, the shallow learning. Then we'll obviously then use the individual customer's um, preferences, anything from brand preferences, category preferences, um, could also be price point affinities as well. So a lot of things that we gather for each individual user. Uh, we talked a little bit about this business logic. Everything that you do obviously has to tie back to revenue and, and even margin uh, and inventory as well. So you wanna have kind of business uh, logic layer running as, as well. And then I think making sure that you use all those signals, um, not just from Magento and, and uh, Nostu, but then looking ahead uh, some of those UGC and social signals, and then of course giving the uh, the merchandiser um, some insight here as well. So just to open that black box a little bit, so what's happening even uh, within the field of of uh, personalization recommendation engines, this is getting more and more complex, adding more and more data points as, as well. So yeah, feel free to feel free to reach out if if we're not covering a specific uh, data point that you think is is relevant here as, as well. Good, yes, yeah, so moving on here, uh, perhaps to uh, the next chapter, so the, the value of, of data, real-time versus uh, transactional. Um, so I think fairly important uh, thing to, to discuss, 
So we do see that there's, a, again, a little bit of a, a mismatch um, in the markets, uh, but AI is really most effective when you set your sights on the right data. So um, it's making sure that it actually works uh, the way it should. So, yeah, so I think many companies uh, merely analyze data on a transactional level um, to provide some form of personalization on site. Uh, but our research actually shows over the last seven years um, that transactional data uh, typically uh, is old data reflecting historical preferences. So, and it only gives you one point, roughly 1.6% of the data captured in an online store. Let's say that's the, the average uh, conversion rate. So what happens with those other 98%? Uh, usually they actually go unused. So that's the most valuable signal that your customer can give you um, is actually contextual, in the moment behavioral uh, uh, data. So we've also noticed from our reach research that even uh, when retailers are tracking on-site uh, browsing behavior, that that data typically becomes available and actionable only at the end of the uh, browsing session, by which point we feel it's absolutely too late to affect the journey uh, because the shopper has most likely already left the store uh, altogether. Uh, in comparison, tracking browsing behavior in real time obviously enables you then to update the, the pages um, during the same session uh, as well, and sometimes even uh, through Ajax within the, within the, uh, the same page without having to do a page, page reload. Uh, and maybe to illustrate this example, so take again uh, a fashion retailer that sells both to both genders, men and women, um, and say you have a strong demographic data placing a male customer, um, let's say he's 30 years old, interested in, in outdoor clothing, and we talked about Zach here uh, just uh, on the other slides. So now that very same person, let's say, comes to your side wishing to purchase uh, a gift uh, for his girlfriend who happens to be a yoga fan. So maybe a question for you, which, which experience do you think will convert the best? Is it taking his historical data, so showing, uh, let's say, the outdoor uh, experience, or should you then shift to that contextual in the moment uh, signal? And obviously we know the answer because we keep uh, track of this and our data science uh, team uh, tracks this, uh, of course, as, as well. Of course, you need to surface then the, the yoga gear if, if uh, that's the, the present uh, for the girlfriend. So, so that's why this behavioral signals are so, so important. And we feel it's, it's um, not really on the roadmap for, for many uh, of our clients. And even the conversations that I have, oftentimes the question is, how can I use my CRM data, um, which is still important, no, no question. Uh, but maybe you're, you're um, yeah, not, not focusing fully on, on the right priorities uh, altogether. Then you might might ask what happens once that gift has been purchased, which experience should we then uh, show, right? So that's usually our smart customers would ask that uh, next. So that's again where machine learning comes in, um, usually what's called like BK modeling. So you try to then make sure that um, if the signal becomes weak and weaker, then you return to either um, the generic experience or you might want to fall back to the transactional data altogether. So definitely also a good, good point to, to mention what happens if, if uh, the con conversion has, has gone through, what should happen, uh, happen next. Great. Um, and of course, you want to make sure when you leverage that data, you want to personalize, um, you want to obviously remember to connect the, the dots. So what do I mean by, by that? I think you want to make sure that you're not only guiding the customer down the funnel, but you're not limiting these segments to just the, the on-site experience. So for example, we, we like to use automated segments to uh, adjust Facebook ads. We want to make sure that we adjust Google AdWords campaigns to reflect buyer uh, profiles as, as well. Uh, we want to create bespoke mobile experiences as, as well. Uh, and then of course, dynamically change the content within emails uh, as well. Um, and so we found that this approach across all the funnels, making sure that those are connected, uh, works works the best and doesn't increase uh, AOV and, and CTRs as, as well. Great. Good. Um, yeah, we promised you that we would also go a little bit into uh, detail around the AI vendor selection uh, as well. So of course, this is becoming more and more important. You want to make sure that 
to make the right uh, decision. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, this is a decision that you make for, for two or three years to make sure that um, these tools really drive value for you. So it's becoming more and more important to uh, yeah, make the right decision. And so I feel also becoming actually more, more difficult to choose a, a vendor because there's so much out there and so much noise. So hopefully today we can help you um, a little bit uh, on that as, as well. So I think to start mapping your uh, journey as, as well, just consider it kind of the, the following points. I would ask probably initially the, the uh, make or buy question. Uh, so ideally, I think we've talked about this before, but you, you need to know what problems you want to solve first. And if it is a common problem, I would say just talk to the vendor landscape. Um, and only if it's a unique problem that only you face, then it might be a good idea to kind of yeah, making a decision towards building out an AI practice uh, in-house if you're a larger, uh, larger e-commerce retailer. Um, and I will also say say this, obviously AI is, is, a, is a powerful tool, but it's obviously not going to uh, solve all your problems, right? So it's not a panacea here altogether. So also make sure that you have all the other uh, points covered as, as well um, in the e-commerce experience. Second thing to really look out for, and this is really, really important, uh, very, very uh, important for us, is to look for that e-commerce focus uh, and make sure that you look at vendors that practice, I would say, almost e-commerce exclusively. So I think the problem with some of those tools that you see out there, they're fairly generic. They're used to optimize, you know, gambling websites. They're, they're optimized to, uh, they're used to optimize travel website, banking website, and so on. So it's more of a, yeah, I would say a different problem that you're solving altogether. So I think you might end up with this broad set of tools that doesn't really um, fit e-commerce. Um, and then there's something to look out for as well as like network effects. So when you have uh, a tool that works exclusively with e-commerce, um, usually that big data is, is used to, um, to split test and optimize those algorithms across stores. Um, so it's something we do, for example, at, at Nostra as well. Or we leverage that data that we see um, across across stores as well. Yeah, and then, then we literally go by revenue impact. So this is maybe something I see oftentimes with in conversations um, is that AI is almost used for those edge cases a little bit. Um, you're kind of losing track of the, the biggest problems that you have. So definitely go by revenue impact. Uh, make sure that uh, you buy tools that then influence uh, most parts of, of your revenue streams as opposed to some edge case uh, altogether. So I think super, uh, super important. And then maybe in, in the end, from my perspective, do you need a standalone AI practice so that this comes up as, as well? So should we build a separate entity in, in, in the company that uh, just yeah looks at AI uh, separately? So we feel it's, it's always a, an applied science. So my suggestion initially is is to ask how AI can improve your kind of current initiatives, whether it's um, on, on the CRO side, whether it's on the, the ad um, acquisition side, as opposed to having a standalone uh, a practice. But again, up to you if you're a larger uh, entity as well, it might make sense to have uh, a separate, a separate um, department. Perfect. This may be a fun, fun exercise uh, to look ahead in, in uh, what AI has in store for us. Maybe as a caveat, so obviously no one can really look into the future. Otherwise, um, yeah, probably not hosting a, a webinar here. Um, but I think it's still still fun to um, uh, look ahead and try to uh, make a prediction how the, the future of, of e-commerce can look like uh, powered by AI. So what are essentially uh, what is the role of the modern e-commerce business owner in a world where acquisition and, and conversion and retention, many of those things are, are automated, and even things like fulfillment, payments, uh, and dropshipping, all of this can be automated um, to, to a large degree. So, so what do we end up doing? Right? What, what's, what's our uh, priority altogether? So I feel there's a few, few endgame scenarios uh, as well, and of course, We'll just restart our tool here, PowerPoint. So bear with me one second. I did clean up the uh, the desktop as, as well, so 
should be uh, should be good. Good. So we'll just continue uh, moving right along. So I think one uh, end game scenario, and this is maybe I would say almost the, the Amazon uh, end game scenario. So achieving a conversion rate of of one. So making sure you have a fully predictive uh, e-commerce future, right? So and yeah, I, I think what what you're trying aiming to do is to make sure that like products almost yeah, out of a, like a magic wand just appear on your doorstep without you necessarily having ordered them all together. They just have such a great fit that you will just accept uh, and you'll say, I'll, I'll buy this product because it just fits my needs and desires and constraints, obviously budget constraints so well that, you know what, I'm, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna keep this this product. And yeah, so this conversion rate of, of one is, is certainly one end game scenario. Um, you need to, I guess, differentiate a little bit between need and one product so if, if you have a a, a need product uh, let's say you're buying uh, groceries as an example so of course you have these smart fridges if you run out of milk then you just uh, automatically buy buy more milk right so getting towards a conversion rate of one is is not that difficult i think it's more difficult than to do that um with uh with one product so obviously things like fashion if we go back to that where you basically have to also understand uh, a customer's, uh, yeah, I would say motivational uh, systems and, and their lifestyle and, and their personal schedule and their moods and so on. And you have to uh, get the customer through a, a sales funnel, which we talked about earlier. So there, probably the conversion rate of one is still a little bit off, but uh, it's, it's not impossible either. But um, that's probably the, the fully predictive uh, conversion rate of, of one uh, future. And it's again, not even today, not completely, uh, yeah, future land. So if you look at Amazon, they do have those predictive warehousing where they do ship items already to those fulfillment centers, essentially waiting for you to order them. So it's not completely out of the, the question either, right? So we're already marching toward that, that future as, as well. So I think very interesting how, how uh, brands will then work within that, um, yeah, within that uh, ecosystem. I think that the second one is probably more realistic for, for uh, folks who are not Amazon. So it's returning to a brand and product centric future. So right, we talked about what is the core competency in, in, in the future. Uh, if everything is, is taken care of. And, and I do think we've done this uh, a full on circle now that you're returning to creating an awesome brand and creating a world-class product. And if I look at the, the 3000 clients that we work with at, at Nosto, so it really does stand out. It's it's either uh, incredible brands who, who've really just uh, made sure that they have incredible brand equity, or you then see uh, this extremely product centric future where you have these world class, unique products. Um, take for example, sea bags. Uh, so you're returning to this craftsmanship um, as, as well. So. And then perhaps a little bit less the the technical side as your competitive edge, which if you think about it, it's, it's basically what business was supposed to be, but we took a little technical detour. Uh, but now we're, I think, uh, essentially getting back to what what was uh, your competitive advantage to to begin with. And perhaps the uh, third scenario is kind of the, the services future. So. Uh, so some might call it creating a community around your product, but I'd almost say it's creating a, a services model around your product, like a B2B style uh, service around your, your items. So take this example from, from Nike, where you have this Nike running club, it's a great idea. So of course, everyone can sell you that jersey or those running shoes, but then you, you build something on, on top of that, which is more difficult to, to replicate. And, and we see this with more and more uh, uh, successful clients of ours that they have a, an amazing product, but then even in B2C, they bundle a service around this, which which I think is a, is a great idea. So might be one uh, that wins out uh, as, as well at the, the end of the day. Perfect. And I don't think there's a kind of a need to, to panic as, as well. So in terms of the role of the human automation, so there's these crazy reports that everybody's is going to lose their, their jobs, but I mean, speaking on, on Nostro's behalf, so we do see that a good CSM, for example, and a 
a client who's working with our tool can still improve the, uh, the performance uh, of even the recommendations uh, and some of those segmentations that we have with their insights, right? So it's, we're not completely making folks obsolete. That's one part. And then the second part, there's obviously going to be new roles of, of the human being as, as well. So I'm, I'm sure you've seen with with Facebook, uh, the news feed, how this is now managed by lots of new employees. Like these are jobs that no one really thought about what would be created, but uh, they now uh, essentially uh, exist based on that AI. So I don't think it's necessarily a uh, time to uh, time to panic, but rather to to leverage those um, those technologies better. Cool. Uh, yeah, so I'm getting to the end of the, the webinar. So obviously I wanna thank you for your attention. I know we uh, get through this um, ahead of schedule here a little bit. Uh, would love to continue the discussion uh, with you guys. So if, if you're in Europe, we do have the uh, Magento Live coming up. So that's October 9th and 10th. Uh, and we'll also have a, a thought leadership session uh, as well with one of our customers. So I think that's at 10 a.m. local time uh, as, as well. Um, yeah, otherwise we do have uh, content for you as well. So just check out Nostra's new guide, Demystifying AI uh, as well. Um, and do reach out to us as well. So sales at Nostra, happy to uh, have a conversation with, with you uh, as, as well. Yeah, so at this point, just uh, wanna thank you again. Um, yeah, and perhaps, Joy, you have any questions, any uh, remarks? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Jan, for your presentation. That was that was super helpful. And um, before we start the q and I just wanted to reiterate that NOSO has a guide um, that demystifies AI, and I posted a link for, for participants on this webinar to download this guide in the chat portion of your toolbar. So if you look in the chat, there's a link where you can link out um, and download uh, NOSO's full AI guides. Um, also, before we start Q&A, um, there's a webinar survey that will launch when you exit the webinar, and I really encourage everyone to take it. It's three short questions, and I use those questions to help me um, plan future webinars. So thank you for ahead of time for filling those out. So um, in terms of the Q&A, we, we do have a couple questions. One that we always get multiple times is, is this best? session recorded and I just wanted to let everyone know that it is and we will give you the recording within a week's time. Um, but I have a couple questions here for Jan and the first one is um, what should what should merchants focus on first when they get started with personalization? And I, I think it was around slide 15 you mentioned a bunch of elements that people can do um, within their sites but, but maybe you can, can touch on that question. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I think we talked about how you should obviously look at it from a revenue perspective. So how much revenue impact will it have? Uh, I think that's your, your first first question. But then I would follow a maturity model, uh, whatever tool you use, whether it's, you know, you're buying an email tool or person, standalone personalization tool. Usually you have these low hanging fruit around which strategies to, to use first. And maybe I'll, I'll make this relevant with with a Nostra standpoint, you might want to start with the, the product recommendations. Then as a step two, you want to have those product recommendations appear in your transactional emails. And then as a step three, once that is successful, uh, you want to continue with starting your, your journey on, on uh, automated segments. So I think you should just uh, start with a maturity model and, and yeah, get, get the low hanging fruit first. Okay. Um, I have another question. If participants want to get in touch with Nesto for recommendations, you know, what are their options in terms of consultations or gathering gathering more information? What do you suggest? Yeah, obviously uh, happy to engage either through content or then uh, in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So if you just want to reach out to sales at Nosto or you can just reach out to me personally as well. So it's uh, jan at nosto.com. So yeah, happy to have uh, that conversation as, as well. Okay, it doesn't look like we have any other questions in the toolbar. So um, I'm going to wrap up this webinar and, and thank you everyone for spending your morning, evening, afternoon with us. 
And just a reminder, this webinar has been recorded and the recording will be posted in the uh, Magento Resources Library. And I, I really want to thank, thank you, Jan and Nosto, for this fabulous presentation. I really enjoyed it. I hope everyone did as well. And I hope to see everyone in our next webinar, which will be next month, and focus on mobile optimization. So have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you.